Hi everyone, Georgie here with Ukraine Matters. Wow, just one busy weekend and we already are drowning in news. So no preamble today, let's just get on with this. We have a lot of things to cover. Today, I want to start by introducing you to the two terms that are now inciting fears in hearts of Russians. So the term number one is called a black mile. So the black mile is a part of the area in a Kursk region where... Ukrainians are absolutely obliterating Russian forces. Russians have tried to advance in that area for so long and they tried to do it so hard that they were hoping they will be able to achieve anything. And right now in the Russian forces, there is this notion that if you get into that black mile, you are not coming back alive at all there is a whole series of pictures that i will leave it in the comment section below check it out and you will uh, exactly clearly see why it is perceived so by russians and remember this is still technically happening on the territory of russia but the second term that is instilling fear in to russians is a so-called kursk uh, exchange program so to say if i can translate it loosely so the Kursk exchange program is one of the ways how Russia is sustaining the forces um, that are being sent to the front lines from Russia. What they're doing is they have these conscriptions that are happening in Russia every half a year. So they're getting usually about 150 to 250,000 uh, young people that need to serve one year in the Russian military. And that one year, they need to be in this military service uh, inside of Russia. So they cannot be sent any kind of external war and so on. So these people, they get indoctrinated daily that U Ukraine is our enemy. The West is about to attack uh, Russia, that uh, it's about time you need to perform your duty. And they're being forced not forced, but like they actually no forced because oftentimes they would also take these guys and they would sit them in front of TV, force them to watch the TV shows, or they would uh, put them into the containment cells and uh, just uh, put on the propaganda to the max. So they, they have a lot of these psychological tactics like to break and pressure these young guys who are usually around 19 to 23 24 years old maximum i know it can go up to 27 but usually it's the younger guys so and they're pressuring them to essentially sign a contract with uh, the russian armed forces and you will then not have to endure this and you will just go fight in ukraine and then you will come back which is completely untrue because contracts that russian forces are signing right now they are without a term so they say, state in a contract when you say that this contract runs out in a year, but when, when the contract term ends, it automatically gets extended because the law that Putin has signed says so, but they still can just write inside of the contract that the contract is just for one year, which is duping a lot of the Russian uh, troops. Uh, but the average living time for newly mobilized, mobilized contract signed forces of stormtroopers is about a month and a half, max. And uh, oh, sorry, not max, that's average. But still, it's it's very, very, very short. But now they have another boogeyman, the Kursk Exchange Program. So what they're stating is, well, you're a conscript. So as a conscript, you can be utilized anywhere on the territory of Russia. So if you will not sign a contract with the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation, we will instead just send you to Kursk where you're going to find it with the same Ukrainians, but and you go to this black mile, but you will also not get all of the benefits. You will not get the money that the people that sign contract get, and you will not get the burial uh, services included into this, like, uh, and like a, a post-mortem payments that Russians are doing to the family uh, of, of the deceased uh, combatant in Ukraine. It doesn't work for Kursk. So a lot of the Russians that die in Kursk, their families are not, not actually getting a free Lada at all. And that's, that's the blackmail that they're being doing right now. And that's why they're able to get a lot of these troops from conscripts. On paper, that means that, well, you know, like these conscripts signed the contracts themselves, 
but they're literally utilizing their, uh, if you want to talk about demographic hole that Russia is sinking, they're utilizing literally their future generations uh, genetic material right now to just go and die in Ukraine like useless pieces of meat that they are. Another big news that happened in recent days is the sudden um, flaming up of the situation in Syria. Now, what you need to know about Syria is there are, by this point, no really good sides that we can support. So all sides that are present on this map, there used to be like some relatively moderate opposition to Assad that you could like, you know, like, it's like, eh, maybe, yes, maybe I can support these guys, but they're, they've been exterminated. They're basically already non-existent as a force. They're gone. So every color, like yellow, green, red, but black, all of it, like it's just the flavors of shit. And, uh, what happened is one of these, like the pro pro Turkish forces, and why they're shit is because they want to ethnically cleanse some other uh, Kurds that are located in Syria as well. So that's pretty very much what they're declaring. But these guys, they're also oppos opposing the Assad forces. Assad a big buddy buddy of Putin. Putin has invested incredible amounts of resources in Syria for Russia, because for for Russia. For them to be relevant in the region, they need Syria. They must have Syria. Syria is their crown jewel in the same sense as Crimea is, uh, except like maybe they don't own it. But basically, when you're talking about Russian reputation in the Middle East, you're talking about the fact that Russia was able to keep Assad in power in Syria despite the rebels and despite the US-backed opposition forces. That's their clout. That's their whole shtick. So suddenly these Turkish-supported forces uh, have made a breakthrough and the front line that seemed to be absolutely stabilized just collapsed incredibly. These uh, forces were able to storm and get to the second biggest city in Syria altogether, the Aleppo, and just take it, just absolutely grab it like within like three days. It's remarkable. Over that, after that, they started advancing towards the south very, very rapidly. The thing that you need to know kind of about Syria, just if you want to look at the map, is that there are two kind of main regions. There is the urbanized region on the western side of Syria, and then there is like desert that almost have nothing there uh, on the eastern side of Syria. So that's why it's not balanced. While there is a lot of red, a lot of this red is just pure desert and doesn't really matter that much. What matters is this uh, more of a western side where, the, where a lot of the urbanized areas are. I'm not going to be following about Syria. But it is relevant because uh, Assad, as soon as this, these events happened, he instantly jumped to plane and he went to his buddy, buddy Putin. And he essentially waited into the waiting room to get to Putin for, I believe it was over a day. And he waited, waited, waited. And finally, he got an audition with Putin. And Putin supposedly agreed that he will be sending some additional forces to uh, to Syria, and he will be helping to supplement the Assad regime. We know that because Assad uh, came out and said that, yes, uh, we're expecting that we're going to break the neck of these uh, um, these uh, fighters, the terrorists, as he called them, uh, that are coming, and we're going to have allies that are going to help us. AI, Russia, is going to come and uh, sweep the day. So what is relevant for us to know with regards to if we're going to follow the map and what to watch out for? Uh, right now, the biggest thing is obviously Aleppo. Aleppo is a major, major city. It's a, I believe, multi-million people city. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and uh, right now, what's important, if you can see, there is this red line. So this is like the highway, the main mm, artery for majority of the country. And what is relevant for us is this part on the west side at all, because this is where a couple of Russian bases are. There is a naval base, and then there is Latakia, there is also aviation base. So I believe the naval base is in Tartus, and then the aviation base is at Latakia. And uh, what's relevant for us is obviously if Russians will be decoupled from Assad forces. So the rebels, or like Turkish-supported rebels, they were able to make it close to the city of Hama, 
and there were instant rumors that supposedly they were able to enter the city but then there was some pushback from the government forces and we cannot confirm that the, the they are present there but if these rebels are able to advance further towards Hama and potentially later maybe take over Homs that would be the crucial point for us because if rebels are able to essentially penetrate and cut off the territories where Russians are that will complicate any kind of Russian operations and that doesn't mean that the Syria will fall again I don't support any party here at all but that will mean for Russia right away that they will need to dedicate even more attention to the Syrian theater. It's clearly the Putin that wants to preserve some uh, forces in the Syria. Then to briefly touch about the situation in Georgia, where the protests are ongoing, I believe for the fifth day right now against uh, the government. Uh, what happened is uh, Georgian Dream, the party that um, faked the elections, uh, they've essentially stated that uh, they are stopping the integration process into European Union of Georgia. They're stating until 2028, but it's very clearly that they want to stop it forever. So uh, as I said last time when there was election, I said that for Georgia, it was the last chance to get their uh, democracy peacefully. Uh, Georgians did not came out in uh, sufficient numbers to completely blow out the election process. So Georgian Dream was able to uh, put themselves in absolute dominant majority on paper, like let's put it this way. And now uh, Georgians are trying to rebel. And as much as this looks great, so far it feels that it's not enough. It feels that the crowds are a bit separated now uh, as days go past. We see now that some of the prominent politicians are being beaten down and it feels that the regime is slowly creeping in and grasping the hold on the Georgian people. So as, as much as I really am glad to see the Georgians unresisting, unfortunately, it seems that it's not enough. And to all of my uh, friends from Sakartvelo, I, I really understand the situation you're, you're finding yourself in. It's very terrible, but it feels that your country is slipping away from you. And if you're not resisting now, then uh, it's going to be only more and more and more. Like, it's going to be Belarusianized. And then you're going to have torture chambers, disappearance of uh, prominent figures, and everything else. You should re read up on what's ha what was happening in uh, Lukashenko's Belarus when he came to power and how suddenly his opposition figures, uh, prominent politicians, just started disappearing and then years later reappearing as uh, either chopped in pieces or murdered in the bushes. There has been significant changes in the personnel in Ukrainian armed forces. Um, for a longer time, there was a critique that uh, this, the command of the Ukrainian armed forces has been um, quite stale and they were following a little bit to the point, like some kind of Soviet doctrines. Like uh, it seems that Sersky was uh, getting people that he was comfortable with. Uh, unfortunately, these people, they were just not adaptive enough to the state of the war. Uh, some of the people from the U Ukrainian armed forces are blaming and stating that it's because of the indecision of these people on, on these positions that came with Sersky. We are now seeing the lack of response from the Ukrainian armed forces to the Russian advances. Um, so the, it's apparent that right now big change has come up. And now there is going to be uh, new generals that are already this war brewed generals. The, for example, the guy that is going to be put in charge of the head of the ground forces of Ukraine, which is the main force, by the way, uh, of the ground forces of Ukraine, will be the General Drapati, who was responsible for um, fixing the mess that happened around the Kharkiv area. So the whole situation that I was just talked about was greatly ex uh, exemplified by the Kharkiv intervention. So when you remember, Russians invaded uh, from the north towards the Kharkiv area in these areas right over here. And what was found out very quickly is that the commanders that were responsible for these areas, they set up shit defenses, they didn't have a proper manning of these defenses, yet they were writing reports that everything is okay, and they were um, documenting like with pictures, videos, and showing uh, some of the examiners only the places that uh, everything was done correctly. So corruption or uh, whatever it is, 
uh, it was really bad. And after that, they sent this General Drapati to essentially come in, fix this area, and uh, stabilize the situation. It was done very, very successfully. So it's very, very renowned person that has uh, earned a lot of respect and uh, he's well known in the Ukrainian armed forces. So that's great news and it's very nice to hear. Now, another rumor that's been going around, mostly because of this Sky News interview with Zelensky, which is ludicrous. So it's 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 kind of hilarious for me because I watched this interview and I almost saw it live, how the media journalists are listening like in one ear and then it completely flows out the other ear. And what was happening in this interview, Zelensky talked extensively long, like uh, uh, obviously the journalist being like a Western journalist, he asked the important question to Zelensky, uh, when you will finally going to be ready to give up uh, and stuff like that. But it was a, a civilized interview. But the point uh, that made a lot of people scratch their heads was specifically when it was asked for Zelensky, well, what about this plan uh, of Ukraine just giving out that territory to Russia? That, that it controls right now, and uh, then the rest of Ukraine is joining NATO. And this is where divergence is coming from, because Zelensky says one thing, and then journalist hears absolutely the other thing. Like, because at the end of the video, and I recommend you watch this, because it's a pretty good interview, and it's also in English, it's like, at the end of the interview, journalist appears, and it's like, wow, it feels like Zelensky is, is definitely changing his stance, and he is already ready to talk about ceding some of that territory to Russia. And I'm like, he, he didn't say that. He didn't say a one bit of that. Like, have you been listening to the p things, the words that were coming out of his mouth? That was the state that I was in. Because what Zelensky actually said, he said that, it's an interesting fantasy you have here, my friend. That's not what he said, but I'm paraphrasing. Just you can watch the interview to actually hear and consider who was a uh, who was two was right. It's like what Zelensky says. Like it's a great fantasy, but no one ever approached us with this kind of plan. He says that if that would be a possibility, that would be an option on how we can end the fire. And then we can transition this war to a diplomatic track. Mind you, Zelensky never, ever denounced the diplomatic track. What he was always stating is that there needs to be a security guarantees for Ukraine. And if they find some kind of diplomatic angle and pressure on Russia, that is the way to go. He would prefer that. He actually underscored it for years. So that is what Zelensky is stating. He's saying is like, if that fantasy scenario that, mind you, never was proposed to Ukrainians, and Zelensky underscores this, he states as like, if that would be, that would be a cessation of, of uh, fire, and that would allow for transitioning to the uh, negotiating track. Because Ukraine needs security guarantees. I even have a shorts, like I have two shorts on this channel, and one of them about the fact that Ukraine needs security guarantees. And Zelensky tells this to the face of this uh, this uh, interviewer, and he then comes out and says, "Well, Zelensky is ready to cede the territory to Russia." It's like mind blown. But yes, the position of Zelensky is exactly the same. Ukraine needs security guarantees. No one is offering Ukraine NATO. Zelensky demanded that they will be invited to NATO, not even join NATO. De demanded, and he heard diddly squat. And now we're talking about the uh, Ukraine apparently ready to cede territory and stop shooting only if uh, there will be something, something, yada, yada, whatever journalist thinks. Apparently, this desire to hear that Ukraine is ready to give up is just like so, so big. Like, it's like, oh, yes, finally, finally, those Ukrainians are going to give up. No, they're not. Like, Zelensky, in, in the recent interview, uh, Schultz came to uh, talks to Ukraine. Schultz is in his, like, I'm not going to go deep analysis. Schultz is obviously in his... Uh, pre-election season so he's now uh, just trying to get as much cloud as possible so i'm not going to comment on this but zelensky basically said like well the russia should go fuck themselves <laughs> basically stating no uh, there is enough of fight in zelensky he understands where they are they're not ready to give up they're not ready to cede their territory but diplomacy like there's different ways what zelensky said from day one almost there's always different ways to fight this war. That talking in di diplomacy is a possibility. It's just like, why? 
I, I love this picture, so I'm just going to show it for you for a second, just so I think it's kind of like self-explanatory, this picture. I think it's perfect. And then finally, I know this video is long. Uh, there is a Keith Kellogg, the new envoy that was supposedly appointed by Donald Trump to solve the Ukraine crisis. There has been an outline for his plan for ceasefire of Russia. And what you need to know about the plan is uh, it's about essentially putting pressure on Ukraine and Russia, uh, trying to get them to talk to each other and maybe get some kind of concessions from both sides and find some kind of peace agreement. It requires a whole my dedicated video that I want to make this week where I'm going to take that plan apart. But the rough thing that you need to understand is that it, everything is going to be in details because this framework that he proposed if details are favoring Ukraine, it could be pretty okay. It couldn't be like maybe absolutely perfect. I don't think it's going to be the way that we should be going forward with this scenario. I think Ukraine should be winning this war, but it's a possibility, you know, like if it's like diplomatic track, Ukraine gets security guarantees, yada, 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 things like that. Or if it's going to be favoring Russia, like we're lifting all the sanctions from Russia, we're like allowing uh, trade with Russia, and uh, we're recognizing the lands uh, that uh, Russia captured as Russia, except Ukraine that doesn't recognize it, then it's obviously going to be devastating, absolutely, for any kind of world order. That's why we need to look into this plan in details, especially when it comes. But I will talk more about Keith Kellogg. Uh, during this week, and uh, it's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, finally, today, thank you so much for making it this far. We are making big, big, big effort this Christmas. Together with Car for Ukraine, we are starting our newest campaign for gathering trucks and drones. We want to get 25 vehicles, sorry, not drones, like the, the recipients of these vehicles will be the new um forces the drone forces the what is it called the uh, unmanned area vehicle forces this is like a new type of force you know like ground forces naval forces and so on this is going to be the drone forces that are present in ukraine and it's pretty good we're going to do 25 vehicles you're going to have ability to get patches you're going to have the ability to get pins join up let's do this this is going to be the start off now and we're going to push it up until Christmas, and hopefully by Christmas we can finish it. It's ambitious to 150,000, but man, guys, like you did incredibly with the last campaign, and I have the full trust of this community that we can do it. Thank you for watching this video. I love you. Slava Ukraini, and I'm gonna leave you with Andriy Luzan, a famous Ukrainian public figure. And I'll see you next time. Human life is the greatest value. Car for Ukraine and the unmanned system forces have joined to provide our warriors with mobility. Using unmanned systems, our men perform various tasks including striking deep into Russian territory, destroying important logistic hubs and targeting high-value equipment like Russia's S-400 Triumph. We are a new branch of the armed forces of Ukraine and we require cars to leverage technology and gain a strategic advantage in the ongoing war. Above all, we prioritize the protection of human life and recognizing the value of every soldier. Join us to save Ukrainian lives and fight against evil.